Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 136. How very fancy. It is very fancy. Very fancy indeed. Into the late 30s. The late, yes, the, now we're in the mid, mid to late 30s. I know. People when they're 36, they go, mid, mid, <laughs> mid 30s. Mid 30s. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> no, my beard. Ah, uh, yes. How are you, Nick? Uh, oh. Golden Grey. Okay, good. Apart from that, I'm fine. Oh, I wasn't agreeing there. I wasn't like, yes, yes, you are. No, <laughs> you no. are. You're very haggard today. Oh, no, you're <laughs> lovely. You're resplendent, resplendent in all your snuggly wear. Yes, I'm, yeah, very, very cash today. <laughs> my, lounge, my, my lounge pants on, my big woolly cardigan, and a big old t-shirt. Yeah, so nice. Like, you yeah. look cosy. I'm comfy. And I'm wearing your slippers. Because <laughs> you insisted. <laughs> yeah, there was a reason. It's not just because I... <laughs> Because that's, that's how I was like, I've got a weird fetish for slippers <laughs> or something. People are coming, I insist you must wear my slippers. <laughs> They're like, okay, we just came to drop off a washing you machine. You had wet feet when you arrived because it's raining and you were complaining that your feet were cold. After a good hour, I was sitting there, I just shivered and you went, what's wrong? I was like, my feet are wet. And then you kicked off your slippers, benevolently, like, yeah. a, like a knight throwing his cape across a puddle. You threw your slippers at me. <laughs> just like, wear my slippers. <laughs> <laughs> now dance, dance. <laughs> rubbing the thighs where my slippers oh <laughs> so you've made it weird I know and I want to take the slippers off now I don't like it I'll suffer the cold <laughs> no you keep them on <laughs> This really bodes well for our trip this week. So full disclosure, people, we are recording this episode a bit in advance of the world has exploded on the day this comes out. We don't know about it yet. Not yet. Uh, because Nick and I and Emma from Real Life Ghost Stories will be holed up in a beautiful, beautiful Airbnb in the depths of Suffolk. Yes. And we may have killed each other by now. Very possibly. Yep. Because we have a whole thing that we're going to weird each other out this whole yeah, trip. Yeah, it's going to be good. <laughs> what can we do to disturb each other the most? And the three of us have never actually spent a protracted time period of time alone. Just, well, three just of us the three of us. In a, in a yes, in a in a in a space. We did it with other people. So like when we went yeah. to New York and things, there's like six of us. Yeah. And of an evening. We spend a lot of time together. The yeah, three but not of us. live together for like four days. No. Well, what so do you think's going to happen? Well, I don't know. I think I think I think people have got weird habits. I think the weird <laughs> things are going to happen. Is this you doing your legal statement yeah. before your weird habits I've now got come it on, out? I've now got it on recording that Sinead and Emma are weird. Um, I am perfectly normal and sane. <laughs> Me and Emma are just going to fight each other and mess about Irish basic bitches. Yeah, the I'm going to be sitting there trying to read my book, having a nice glass <laughs> wine. Will you just pipe down the two of you? The two of us play fighting, making a fort on the sofa. Yeah. And then Emma sneaking in at night to touch your beard. <laughs> But then you are you are going to outweird us. This is the thing. Yeah. We 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 think we're so funny and kind of like oh we're going to creep out no Nick. No idea. <laughs> oh. Nick's going to do weird stuff. Oh yeah. I'm looking forward to it. We're going to find a crow in our bed. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to find something. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> marvelous! Any poisonings this week? I don't know. Not yet. No, Not yet. No, so it's far. early because it, I don't know what it is. But you said before, time wibbly wobbly. Yeah, uh, time wibbly wobbly. <laughs> Poisoning? No. No, you're confused. <laughs> What's going on? Well, speaking of your friends weirding you out and having some sort of competition who can be the most gross when you go away together, I think it is time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. Yes, I'm sure they aren't gross at all. Thank you very much to Incognicat. To Hannah Krajek. And to Casey Smith. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. At the time of our recording, these were our Patreon subscribers. We love you so much, you very, very sexy people. It is fun over on Patreon. Obviously, we don't know what we've done this week. <laughs> this time. <laughs> Yeah, we're recording it all back to front and wibbly wobbly. But we like to give you a peek behind the curtain uh, sometimes on this show. But really, for more peeks behind the curtain, a bigger peek, if you will, pull the curtain back fully, go over to Patreon. We have recently released some more of our blooper reel, which gives you a real look behind <laughs> at really not in just behind the curtain, like climb over the top of the counter and see what goes on. The chaos. When we record and the hilarity and some of the extended discussions that we have from the episodes actually end up on the and the blooper reels so well worth checking out if you like a giggle also for our cyanide connoisseurs the short story fictional readings have continued yeah can't stop Sinead oh yes into the dark winter months and welcome more suggestions on there as well we'll also be having a chat and a little bit of new content this month determined to do my book roundup my book club <laughs> for people so hopefully it will happen people. hopefully I'm sure it will it will I've got a new kit coming with a ring light and everything <laughs> so I mean that's going to inspire you to do all the things I mean I may just do a video for Patreons of just me with a ring light and look, uh, look at me 
look how look at my face. <laughs> it would be fun. Yeah. So if you want to know what the hell we're talking about, please do join us on patreon.com forward slash the poisoners cabinet. That's where all the extra content is at. Well, Nick, are you ready? Probably not. I should be. To to maybe drink cocktails and talk about poison. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or mm. we could we could like drink poison and talk about cocktails. I, I'm confused. Yes, am I? So and I feel like this is the week we'll mix it up. <laughs> it's 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 all very yeah, discombobulating. <laughs> I'm going for a cocktail. I'm gonna and whatever that one entails. Great. We'll go with the first one. Yes. Hooray! 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 It is Nick's story this week, but we can't. We can't. We can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. It's not as if we haven't already poured ourselves a hefty, hefty Negroni. <laughs> as you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell and will flavor our cocktail of the week. And this week's secret ingredient, Nick, is his hands. His hands. Oh, hands. 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 Now, there's lots of hand is quite culty. Because you've got the hand of glory. Yes. Uh, the black hand, sort of, we go back into sort of maybe crime syndicate sort of territory. Okay. <laughs> Why not? I, I said, you, I've been watching you, The you, Godfather. You made that up. <laughs> no, it's, oh, I talked about it on one episode. How can you not remember? We talk about a lot of stuff I don't remember. <laughs> well, with hands then as the ingredient, as the inspiration, what have you come up with? This week we are having a left hand. A left hand? Left hand. Ooh, sinister. Like well, it. Well, quite. Mm. Yes. And we've done a hand before, we've haven't we? We've done a right we? hand. We've oh. had a right hand in the past. Now we're having a left hand. Interesting. Yeah. Ooh, will it be I the should, same? We should make both. Oh, should we make both? No, 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 no. No, that could go horribly wrong, I feel. But then we'll try and clap them together and everything will spill. <laughs> yeah, that would go very badly. <laughs> oh, yeah. left hand. But that's, yes. Oh, that's the sign of the sinister side, isn't yeah, it? Indeed. All you lefties out oh, there. Oh, yes. Work of the devil. Ooh. All that. So, yeah. Left hand we're having. I think it is high time for us to head into the poisonous cabinet kitchen. Hands first and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Uh, hello. Will Nick. Hmm. The left hand. Or the right hand. I've already <laughs> forgotten which one it is. This <laughs> is the right hand we've done it's before. Definitely the left. The this left is the, hand. This is the left. Oh, now this looks very resplendent. Hmm. It's verging on brown, but I'm going to say it's a ruby red. Yeah, I would go with you on that one. And you've got it in your very beautiful glasses. Yeah, I like these glasses. Ooh, looks like our sort of thing. Yeah, indeed. All right, so should we dive in? Let's give it a go. Left hand, left hand handshake. Yes, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Mm, um, okay. Hmm. Mm. Mm. <laughs> it promises a lot. Are you not convinced? I don't know. <laughs> it, it seems like the colour and the, f- the the first taste you get should be everything that we like. But it suddenly went, oh, lots of flavour, nothing. <laughs> yeah, mm. I'm a bit... I don't know. <sighs> Slightly ambivalent about yes. that, really. Yes, it's... It, it feels like it's got the makings of something like a Red Hook or a Negroni. There's definitely Campari in that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because yep. the colour and the bitterness. Yep. But I'm just getting Campari, so, really. Hmm. And then sort of, yeah. So I'm intrigued by that one. It's thrown me. I thought I would enjoy that more than I did. We, we've had the privilege of trying a lot of good drinks. That is very true. Mm. And that our palates have become accustomed to the finer <laughs> things. And maybe after the onslaught of last week's cocktail as well. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure. So uh, talk us through okay. it. Okay. So, yeah. So we have the uh, left hand. Now, this is actually made by um, a bartender called Sam Ross at uh, Attaboy. Once, once was um, milk and honey at Attaboy. And this is one of his recipes. It is a it is a variant of a Bouvalier, which is itself is a variant of a Negroni. It's so funny. we have bourbon. Nice. We have uh, Campari. Okay. We have red vermouth. Okay. Okay. There, which is your classic. Bouvalier. Yep. Traditionally in a Bolvardia, I would go for equal quantities of each. My, my, my. This this has got twice as much bourbon as it does the other two. It does ingredients, yeah. So, so this is one and a half ounces of bourbon and then mm. three quarters of the Campari and the red vermouth in this one. So the quantities are not what I would usually use for a Bolvardia. But then it also has the addition of the mole bitters, the chocolate oh. mole bitters, um, which was used in the right hand right. as well. Culture. But that one's based with rum. This is based with bourbon. So okay. that's where the link between those two comes in. So yeah, yeah so bourbon. Campari, Revermouth, and Mole chocolate bitters. I'm, <sighs> I'm, yeah. As I said, ambivalent is a good word yes, for it. It's not, it's sh- not dreadful, but it's not lighting my world on fire. Which is a shame because yeah. having been to, as we said, we, we will never stop talking about mm-hmm. having been to Attaboy and the and the marvelous time we had there. And I remember being served a cocktail by the by the brilliant uh, bartender there, 
which I started off going, oh, no, that's too bitter. I'm not going to like this shit. I've ordered a bad cocktail. <laughs> and then three sips yeah, in, I was like, oh, wow. Oh, my God, it's amazing. So maybe I'm hoping this will develop. Maybe, maybe it will develop. But um, the, I've had two sips. Let's go for let's the third. Go for third. Let's you go crack for on, the third. See what happens. Yeah. It, it's fine. It's fine. It's just a Boulevardier, but not, but weird. Yeah. I don't like, I don't love the... the but I think the ratios are not, yeah. not, not for me. I would stick with a classic Boulevardier. It's not not quite hit the hit the mark. I feel if you'd never had <laughs> all of the cocktails we've had, if you've never, if you've never had the hundred and thirty five cocktails that we've had, <laughs> well, I don't want to sound like princesses here. And yes, we're very privileged, completely privileged, <laughs> that we get to drink lots of delicious cocktails and sample them <laughs> and, and 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 try different variations on them. If you'd never had a Boulevardier, and if you liked mm. a Negroni, this would be very nice. Absolutely. I'm not getting the Mole Bitters. I mm. really do not see any difference between yeah. that and the Negroni we had earlier. Uh, apart from it, it being, yes, I can tell there's bourbon in it. But I would just think that's a Boulevardier that had been mixed a bit stronger. Yeah, I'm not even smelling the bitters, to be honest. Did you actually put bitters I in did, there? I did, I did put bitters <laughs> in there. Because I, I remember thinking, because I've got the, the, the Fentimans ones, which were like a, were like a dropper mm. on them. And you open the bottle and the smell of chocolate, really yeah. strong. Not, uh, perhaps I should have put more in. Um, Where, where's the, I'm going to put some They're in, in the, oh, I'm in, get in the kitchen, going in the bottle. We'll see if adding a few more drops does the trick. Glumpy, glumpy, glumpy. Don't drop the big old bottle. No, but your slippers are huge. <laughs> or you're tiny. And my slippers are entirely normal size. Why is the woman always blamed? <laughs> you blame my slippers. <laughs> With good reason. Uh, right, okay. So I've got the mole bitters. Yeah. And the first time we used the mole bitters was in the right I hand. Think, and I think I bought them especially for that cocktail. Yes, back in uh, episode 83, I think it was. The Red Barn. Stop I've, I've... pretending you knew that. <laughs> of course I didn't. I looked it up a minute ago. <laughs> Thanks to the beautiful listeners who have sent us a spreadsheet of going, by the way, here's everything you've ever done. Because you can't remember. But yes, and, and, and we had a row at the time. I think mole, 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 mole. But um, these smell amazing. Yet there is none of that in that cocktail. So I'm going to go rogue. And I'm going gonna, for well, it. So what? Ha- oh, ooh, that was two drops. Give it a go. See what happens. That enough? Do you, you think? Might, you might want to grab a s- stirry. Or, given its hand, the finger. <laughs> the finger. It's going to be a finger job, guys. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try it before I. Uh, <laughs> it's it's weird. Going, it's going well. Okay, that's interesting. Is it making a, an improvement? That gives it an aftertaste. I'm going because to at go first I well. thought, oh no, it's just bourbon. No, that gave, gives it a chocolatey aftertaste of the spice. Oh, no, I want more. Because <laughs> that mole stuff, oh, oh no, mm, that tastes delicious, that mole stuff. I'm thinking that's going to be interesting in cooking, that mole stuff. Oh, mate. Now, that's interesting. Yes. I did not use enough bitters on that one. No, that, oh, with more bitters in there than that, that's, that, that's now something. We're, now we're talking. <laughs> Isn't that mad? Just yeah. a couple more dashes. A couple more drops. Completely changes that. And the temptation would be, for me, because I, I'm not someone who does things by half. <laughs> No, no, the whole pipette and like three more drops, that'll be fine because you don't think it's that strong. Just a couple more is enough to completely change that cocktail into something really that interesting. Made a big, big difference, that. Oh, mate. Oh. <laughs> See, this is why we need a video on bitters, Nick. <laughs> mm, we do. And it's coming up. Don't you worry, people. Do you feel happier with definitely, that now? Definitely, definitely. Yeah, getting a bit of a chocolate the chocolate hit there and a bit of the spice. Okay, now we have a good one. Now we have a good one. Okay, <laughs> it was looking dodgy there it for was. a minute. People, we are okay. So they saved it with the extra bitters. <laughs> with me determined you stomping around in your slippers. Okay, Nick, so we have the left hand in hand. In left hand in hand. It's weird. We're holding our own hands. <laughs> is it time for a story? Miss certainly is. Hooray! Hurrah, hurrah. Woo. So this week we have the story of Winnie Ruth McKinnell. Ooh, stunning. Yeah, now Ruth, as she becomes known as Ruth, she is born in 1905. Mm-hmm. She's the daughter of a Methodist minister, the Reverend H.J. McKinnell, um, and his wife Carrie. Now, unsurprisingly, it's a relatively strict upbringing. Minister's Ooh. daughter and all that, so he's going to be heavy on the church going and the Bible. And it may well be that sort of the, the rather sort of never-ending list of church services and prayers take their toll on on young Ruth, really. And she does sort of take comfort in a bit of her own little imaginary world, really. So Aww. I think it's all very strict and very formal, but she, she's got an imagination on her. She she goes with it. I quite but, like but, that. Yeah, but she goes with it to a few extremes. Oh. So when Ruth is seven years old, she tells all her school friends that her mother is having a baby. She's going to be a big sister. She's so excited. Mm. She's going to be a sister. 
new spreads. All the neighbours come to congratulate Mrs. McKinnell. No, 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 I'm not pregnant. <laughs> N- oh. n- none of that. Oh, but she's seven. It's, it's all it's all been made up. Is she? Just, does she just not understand that if you wish a baby into existence? <laughs> maybe, maybe <that's>... I'm <laughs> being too harsh on her. All right. Well, the first one will let there, slide. That one there. But then, as she's older, she's a teenager now. Okay. And she accuses her boyfriend of getting her pregnant. Mm. And she's never had sex. Yeah, she needs some sex education with him or anyone else. But she's convinced she's pregnant. Right. The, the family take her to the doctor. Let's just be sure. So the family take her to the doctor. No, 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 no. pregnancy Everything here. And, in, intact. And yeah, exactly. From what he can tell, nothing's been going on down there whatsoever. But she remains adamant. No, she is pregnant. Oh, immediate thoughts of church-led well, upbringing. We, potentially, yes. So I'm not familiar with the Methodist <laughs> teaching. So if I'm getting this wrong, I'm, I really apologize. But you would have thought that that story is in there. The as well. story it's, it's, it's is in there. It's a central element, one would assume, to sort yes. of both Christian denominations. Uh, perhaps they don't. Some some people don't. But, you know, the Immaculate Conception. So maybe it, this just seems like she don't understand how babies yeah, are made. Yeah, but she, she remains absolutely adamant that, yes, she is. And she ends up running away from home oh. because no one, no one believes her. Oh. She does come back. And then she says she was kidnapped. And while she was away, she gave birth. She had the baby. The kidnappers took the baby and let her go. What's going on? So wow. everyone's going, really? We're not? No, no, you weren't. You just ran away for a bit. And then you've come back. You haven't had a baby. You weren't kidnapped. Oh, I'm fully invested in this. Yeah. This is fascinating <laughs> immediately. So, I mean, everyone in the town really believes she is just absolutely desperate for attention. Her father is, he's a... A busy man. He say he's the he's the minister there. Yeah. He's got people coming and going at all hours of day, wanting his help and guidance or what have you. His wife is a minister's wife, so she's also equally busy with dealings mm. of the church. So has she just been left to her own devices a bit too much, and is just sort of trying to go hello, I'm here. Oh. But so I mean, Ooh. from then on, really, anything that she claims is taken with a little bit of a bit of a pinch of salt. Really, in town, and no one really thinks. Yeah, all right, okay, fine, Ruth. Well, <laughs> so, yeah, of course that happened. Absolutely. Everyone, everyone's from Tottenham, and just sort yeah. of, like, yeah, all right, Ruth, lovely, lovely, lovely. Ruth, yeah, 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 all right, yeah. <laughs> when, when she's a teenager, she goes to work at Indiana State Hospital. She goes Ooh. to work as an attendant there, and she does really well at this. She's very good with patients. She's the the other staff at the hospital will really take kindly to her, um, and she's encouraged to take on more and more responsibility. At the, she's still only a teenager mm. at this point, but they, you're you're good at this job. You crack on and go for it. Great. And it's at the hospital that she meets her future husband, a uh, Doctor William C. Judd. Judd. Now, Dr. Judd is a World War I veteran. He was injured during the war and has developed a lovely morphine habit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say limp, but morphine habit. No, no, no habit. morphine <laughs> habit. Morphine habit from, him, from his injuries. Oh, bless He's him. also 26 years older than Ruth Ew. at this point. But of course, Ew. love wins out. True love will always win. Does it? And in 1922, they marry. Ages. Ruth is 17. William Judd is 40. Huh. Mm. I know it was the style of the time. <laughs> now, the doctor's morphine addiction soon starts to cause a bit of trouble at the hospital. Shocking! He's working at, and he's suspected of perhaps writing some false prescriptions. Things go missing from medicine cabinets. Can't really prove anything, but mm. probably him. He hands in his notice. Before anything can be formal, can be done about it, he, okay. he decides to, to quit, quit his job. And while the newlywed couple are on a honeymoon in New Orleans, he manages to secure himself new employment. This time as a position as a doctor at a mining company in Mexico. A field medic, really, in at the mines yeah. in Mexico. It's nice that he moved on quite quickly because yeah. you've got a lot of doctors who just go, no, nope, no, nope, no, there's nothing wrong while killing patients and taking yeah. loads of drugs. No, no, so he was... And in small mercies small as well, mercies. that you're a massive <laughs> morphine addict and yeah. also draining the hospital dry of resources. But no, he, he finds alternative employment and takes his, his new wife down, down to Mexico. Down now, Mexico. Ruth has never been out of the little town that they she's grown up in under this very strictly religious environment mm-hmm. so oh this is a change oh yeah <laughs> she's Down now in, in this like mining community with like rough and ready chaps and things like that so she's a bit like oh fuck <laughs> <laughs> love mexico people <laughs> so, absolutely you guys got a lot down yeah absolutely so she's a bit like wide-eyed and oh this is different she's saying that she's saying she's that. There. oh this is different oh, this is very different have you heard of the lord <laughs> i like the look at that tequila <laughs> Now, Ruth's marriage to Dr. Judd ends up not really being the happiest 
of marriages. You surprised me, I know me, no one would have thunk it. The big drug addict and his teenage addict. bride. Now, she is desperate to have a child. She wants to start a family. That's really all she wants. I mean, since she's been little, she's been making up stories about having a baby and being pregnant and stuff like that. But the doctor, in a sudden sort of a, a rare moment of sort of self-realization, the doctor says, no, he is not fit to be a father. He is a, a, a morphine addict. He's mm. verging on an alcoholic as well at this point. And he says, no, we cannot have a child because he's too unstable to be a father. So that's what he's entirely convinced, that he is vehemently opposed to any sort of family. Fine if that's his principle, not giving him any credit whatsoever, oh, as God, I like, no. but still be my wife. But still be my wife, Still be absolutely. my wife. This is a whole thing that you are really committed to, but also yeah. I don't really want to be a father, so can you just be okay with yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. You just deal with my issues. Uh, it doesn't really matter what you want, because um, I'm the man. Taylor's oldest time. Now, Ruth, she does try her best to get her husband free of his addictions, to help him, get him out, yeah, get him away from the from the morphine. She thinks if he is more stable, if he's more settled down, then perhaps he will be open to the possibility of, of having God, a family and oh. she can live happily ever after. Oh, On one occasion, she does actually fall pregnant. But the doctor takes it upon himself to decide that <gasps> Ruth is not emotionally stable enough to have a child and he forces her to have a termination. This is not fun, Nick. <laughs> I'm glad we have strong drinks. Yeah. There is a lot going on. Yeah. Oh, the poor thing. Oh, poor. I mean, she she is thrown into a deep depression by by all his actions. Absolutely. And for some, for some reason, the doctor is surprised by by his wife's anger um, oh, you towards him. Selfish. Um, prick. And he falls back into old habits, resulting in in him losing his job at the mining company because yeah. he's now oh but why my wife is pissed off at me i don't know why morphine 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 um <laughs> let's just agree that it's not a good match it's not a good neither match. neither person are in a good place no but still this is just stop being married stop being, stop married. being married yeah the, the pair leave mexico um determined to start fresh it's gonna be better we'll find someone new it's gonna be marvelous <laughs> i love that <laughs> i know this is dark but every now and then you and i still have these conversations you know when you're really feeling shit you go if i move if i move country yeah. this will be fine i'll just move into the next county that'll be okay and that will solve all of my problems yeah and thankfully most of our friends are around to go no nope. no 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 it's not gonna work <laughs> but they, they they they're convinced it will they're convinced it will so mm -hmm. they arrive in liado in Texas. The first thing the doctor does is sell their car and use all their money to buy all the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth is going, no, we've been here half an hour. You've sold the car <laughs> and you've just got a big bag of drugs now. <laughs> she's just come in and gone to the grocery store and she's gotten milk and bread and some eggs. It's okay. He is high as a kite yep, on absolutely. a bench. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awful, but still, that's quite fun. Yeah, now this is, thankfully, it is the last draw for Ruth. She's had, absolutely had enough, and she does leave. She goes to Phoenix. So in 1930, Ruth is now living in Phoenix, Arizona. She's been able to get a job as a governess for the wealthy Ford family. Brilliant. And she loves her job. She's absolutely having a fantastic time. She may not be able to have children of her own, but she actually dotes upon the young ones that she's looking after. And it's while working at the Ford house that she makes the acquaintance of her, her employee's friend and neighbour, the next door neighbour, a chap called Jack Halloran. Hmm. Jack Halloran, who's also known as Happy Jack. <laughs> He's Happy Jack. He is Happy Jack. He's a successful businessman. He's a well-known socialite and ladies' man around town. Uh, he's charming oh, right. he likes to party um, and his <laughs> his connections his business connections ensure that there's, there's a constant flow of bootleg booze flowing or whatever event he's at because we're in the middle of prohibition at the moment yes of course yeah. so yeah his dealings there's constant supplies of alcohol wherever he goes I love the fact that his nickname is Happy Jack yeah. definitely wasn't his nickname his <laughs> nickname was Boozy Jack Shagman <laughs> now Boozy Jack Shagman he is he is married as well <laughs> for his wife Happy Jack <laughs> but it, his wife seems to prefer the quiet life at home she's not much of the party girl so she, yeah she's she's happy at home Jack is seen every night with a different beautiful woman on his arm Jack and Ruth strike up a bit of a friendship do they? Yeah, absolutely. The two would sit on the porch for hours talking about anything and everything, <laughs> loving a lovely time. It doesn't really matter that they're both technically still married. Oh, absolutely. None of that. They sit on the porch swing and have yeah. a glass of cold lemonade. Absolutely. They sit on the veranda. It's very <laughs> exciting. <laughs> the floating veranda. <laughs> the floating magic veranda. It's very romantic. <laughs> And their friendship does quickly blossom into a passionate romance. 
Ruth is still torn, though. She is still married. She does have a little bit of affection left for her husband. She takes her vows very seriously, her upbringing. So she takes marriage and the commitment she's made incredibly seriously. He may be a twat, but she's still married to him. <laughs> so she's really, really torn. And she is falling for Jack quite, quite hard. Mm. Jack, on the other hand, is slightly less worried about the whole commitment thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he makes it clear to Ruth, really, that he's not really a one-woman kind of guy. It was fun, but let's not get too carried away. Oh, Ruth thinks she can change him. Ruth, absolutely. Ruth is getting more and more smitten and thinks, I, no, this can work. This can be my chance to be, I'll be happy and I'll have my own family and it'll be marvellous. Now, Ruth's dalliances with Jack makes her position as governess next door <laughs> slightly untenable, really. Um, <laughs> so it's not ideal for the Ford family. So whether she's asked to go or she decides to go before she's pushed we don't really know but she does leave that that employment yeah. but she quickly finds another job as a, a medical secretary at the grunau clinic which is a private little private hospital in phoenix so at the clinic there she meets a couple of friends she meets agnes Lois, known as anne and anne introduces ruth to her housemate um hedvig samuelson brilliant um, a teacher who goes by the name of sammy why not hedvig but hedvig is a good name but no she decides mm. no i'm gonna go with sammy Now, the three of them quickly become fast friends. There has been some speculation that Anne and Sammy were actually in a relationship Hmm. um, together, but in 1930, such things were not discussed. No, we don't talk about we don't that. Talk, we don't talk about such things. The pair had previously lived together in Alaska, which is very, very far away and very, very cold, um, <laughs> where Sammy had actually developed tuberculosis. So they had moved to Phoenix, thinking that perhaps the, the warmer, the drier climate might help her symptoms. Yeah. So they seem quite committed to each other. That they've moved all the way across the country well, that's um, for, for Sammy's health reasons. That is a love that yeah, knows no bounds. Absolutely. So the three of them, they get on like a house on fire. They are three independent women. Yeah. They all work. They like to have a good time. They like a drink. Mm. Have a drink. They're, they're having a fantastic, fantastic time. Ruth even actually briefly moves in with a, with a pair hmm. in her apartment, but is it just a bit too small for three of them and, and tempers and nerves start to fray so Ruth is now nah, I'm gonna get my own place but only just around the corner really so they're still thick as thieves no I like that I like the sisterhood together and also being able to draw the line going we're all getting annoyed at each other yep. I'm gonna be around the corner but we'll still have brunch exactly another thing they find they have in common Jack Halloran what mm. wait a minute what <laughs> turns out Happy oh. Jack owns the building that Anne and Sammy live in and he's quite the frequent visitor oh. to the to the apartment. Oh, come on now. Yeah. No. Jack gets around all... a bit. Oh, my God. Are they all his little harem, as he would see it, and they're all shagging him? Yeah, well, me say, Ruth knew that Jack has, is, has, has, his no, girlfriend. has no shortage of female company. Mm. But it's a little bit of a surprise to find out that Anne and Sammy were two of them. <laughs> <laughs> so she's a bit like... Oh, okay. Uh, is it a surprise? I mean, how, I think that's, that's, a, massive co- that's a massive it is coincidence. It's a massive coincidence. No, I don't think that's a massive coincidence. I think that Ruth really has feelings for him, has researched enough or is able to then to move in and then find the, the, the building that he owns and but then she, befriends the girls who are also his lovers. But she, she meets Anne at work at the clinic. Yeah. She, she's a technician at the clinic. And they would have talked about Jack together. May, well, maybe. That seems, that seems very... Machiavellian if she have you met women <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're gonna <laughs> if she's in a relationship with this player she's gonna befriend all his well, fair, fair, fair enough fair enough Ruth 100% knew what was going on in that house I'm just so naive in the, in the ways of such things <laughs> that's too big a coincidence I mean I, when I was reading that again that is a big coincidence but none of the, none of the resources ever actually mention they they always they always yeah. portray it as a as a as a coincidence oh, on the face of things, yeah. but probably conversations were had. Oh, I have no doubt. And it's not like cut and dry. It's not Machiavellian, mm. as you said. It's not like ah, ha, ha, I'm going to try and <laughs> screw people up. It's just this a muddy, sad it is. composite of a relationship that yeah. is kind of like free and easy on one hand, and also ugh, someone's really got deep feelings for yeah. this person who has multiple relationships. I mean, whatever her qualms were about the the situation with the, the multiple partners that Jack had, mm. she does seem to push this to the back of her mind slightly because she she does like Jack. She really likes Jack. Mm. And if accepting his dalliances are part of the package, part of the deal, then she's going to have to learn to accept it. If she wants to be with Jack, this is who Jack is. Deal with it or just leave. She wants to stick with it. The apartment becomes a bit of a party central. 
really. Mm-hmm. Jack arrives. He brings his married friends with him. He brings crates <gasps> of bootleg alcohol to these gatherings. Jack and his friends shower the women with with gifts as well it's turning into a slight brothel uh, yeah going, yeah this isn't oh, going on oh, no, 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 um, no 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 yeah no, no. ruth is still remains convinced that he that she and jack have got something special that there's something going on there that she can work she can get through to him and do this and she, she does get especially annoyed if if she discovers that jack has actually he's paying visits to Anne um, and sammy when she's not there if she's there, it's fine. But if he's going behind her back or just not telling her I'm paying visits, that's when she gets a bit like... Nah. Oh, Ruth. One night in the fall of 1931, Ruth is invited to Anne and Sammy's apartment just for a general chat, chat and, and an evening. Nothing, no parting or anything like that. She declines the offer saying she's got to work that evening. Mm-hmm. In fact, she actually plans to meet up with Jack and she doesn't want the others to find out and, and get get involved as well. <laughs> get uh, involved. Get involved. We'll We're just fuss. going to have some tea. Hello. Yeah. Well, what they're actually, she's actually going to do is that she's going to introduce Jack to one of the other nurses that she works with, a woman called Lucy Moore. Now, Jack has told Ruth that he and his buddies are going off on a hunting trip. Mm-hmm. coming up and lucy is from this particular area that they're going hunting to ruth thinks right lucy give us some local knowledge of of the area where to go where's good to stay all this sort of stuff i think that is what she's got in her mind a very innocent sort of oh god chat going oh, on ruth. there so, <laughs> local insight no 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 ruth <laughs> so jack and ruth go and pick up lucy okay. on, on their way on their way out to a nice bar or something like that jack then announces that he wants to stop at annie and sammy's he wants to go and see annie and sammy on the way he's got something he needs to drop off and something he needs to say to them <laughs> ruth is not happy about this she's already turned down an invitation on the pretense that she's got to work so she doesn't want to rock up with jack and lucy and toe because that's like that's gonna be a bit awkward yeah. so it's a fine okay i'll wait in the car you go in i'll wait in the car we'll see you when you've done whatever you need to do blah blah, blah. of course jack goes in and tells Anne and sammy ruth's in the car come say hello <laughs> <laughs> So Sammy and Anne go outside. Ruth introduces them to Lucy, who's sitting in the car going, what the fuck's going on here? (laughs) (laughs) This is is really weird. Nothing is said that night, but Anne and Sammy are not happy. Firstly, their friend is lying to them about about her evening plans. And also, they think she's introducing Jack to this prettier, younger woman. Yeah. Is uh, Ruth trying to Mm. tempt Jack away from Anne and Sammy by offering something different? That, so they've, they've, they're coming up with all these plans about why she's introducing Lucy. I actually think Lu- Ruth is just going, oh, she's from where you're going. And all okay, these nice Nick. things. Again, me probably being very naive about these things. Ruth is trying to control this situation. Oh, good. Uh, I, will, I will offer that massively. as an opinion. Abs- no, absolutely. This other girl she can introduce and in a toxic relationship... <laughs> And it's probably going, okay, well, well, this girl, we, we, we can kind of have this sort of open relationship with them, but she's probably threatened by the other two. And the other two are like, wait control. a minute. Yeah, yeah. No one is at fault individually, but everyone's in a bad dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of bad dynamics going on there. Yes. Uh, Everything that seems fine on paper does not always work <laughs> out, yes. particularly at this time. Yeah. It's not going to go well. They're coming out and yelling through the car window going, who's that? Who is that? Who's what that? are you doing here? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> Why is she wearing a negligee? T- for no reason. She likes to walk around like that. That's what she likes. It's fine. Oh, but though, isn't it, isn't it, the women are pitted against each other? Mm. Oh, the bloody you see, Jeff, hell. Jack is, Jack is the hero here. He's... No one is having a go at him. No, absolutely. <clears throat> no. <clears throat> the women are at each other's throats um, about this to get his affection, to get his attention. The next night, Ruth is once again invited to Anne and Sammy's to play cards, along with another friend. Um, Again, she declines, saying, I've got too much work to do. Mm -hmm. But later in that evening, she changes her mind. Right, I need to go and clear the air. I need to get things sorted, get things straight. Um, I'm going to go and pay a visit. And now what happens during that visit is slightly up for grabs, really. There is no Mm. one version of events. The story gets changed over multiple tellings and letters and confessions so there's not really a definitive version in the most sort of accepted version really ruth arrives just as the other friend is leaving leaving the three and sammy and ruth in the apartment together and demands to know why she has introduced jack to lucy what's going on there what's the plan doesn't ruth realize that jack is going to fall for the younger women who 
forget about all the rest of them mm. and just go for the for the young woman and where are they all going to be then ruth thinks anne is massively overreacting and a huge argument blows up in the apartment anne threatens to tell jack that ruth has introduced him to someone with vd she's claiming Whoa. that lucy is riddled with <laughs> with diseases and threatens to tell yeah ruth has done that ruth retaliates saying that she's going to tell the doctors at the clinic that anne and sammy are lesbians Oh, God. That they're in a relationship, which, again, say is not a thing. It's not a good thing in the 1930s. Sammy is a teacher. She will lose her yeah. job. And Anne at the clinic, well, they both lose their jobs if this were made public. So it is getting really horrendous. Ooh. Horrendous things are being hurled at each other. Sammy disappears into the kitchen and she comes out brandishing a gun, <gasps> shouting that Ruth better not tell anyone anything bad about Annie. Mm. If she does, horrible things will happen. Ruth lunges at sammy with the gun and they they struggle and as they do Anne starts hitting ruth with an ironing board <laughs> okay i did yes. not see the ironing no, board coming no, no out one sees the ironing board coming uh, <laughs> i mean it's it's a good weapon yeah well it's, it's the hand it's in, the, sorry, in the kitchen yeah. yeah it's got big metal bits on it so uh, she's trying to clout ruth with the ironing board while she's struggling with her partner with the gun oh good lord okay the gun goes off oh. ruth gets shot through the hand the hand through the hand the left Actually, hand the left hand, the left hand. <laughs> she very gets nice very shot nice. through the hand the gun is dropped yeah. onto the floor as ruth recoils in pain um and is still there with the ironing board <laughs> going, going going at it because ironing board would have been difficult as a cocktail ingredient <laughs> <laughs> yes i did look and i'm like <laughs> not many ironing board cocktails out there Although I wish they had been. But Ruth seems to ignore the pain in her hand. And again, they scrabble for the weapon that, that's been dropped. Uh, Sammy and Ruth are going at it again. The gun goes off again. Sammy clutches her stomach and <sighs> drops down. She has been shot straight through the stomach. Killed pretty much oh, instantly. Sammy. Now Sammy is dead on the floor. Ugh. Ruth has a bullet hole through her hand. And Anne has just seen her lover murdered. She rushes at Ruth. Ruth fires again. Point blank range. Annie falls dead. <laughs> we now have two dead women in the apartment. Oh, now there is another version of events okay. that says that Ruth has actually arrived with the gun. Mm. She has there. This, this was not an argument that blew up and things just got carried away. She went there with the intention to kill the women yeah for whatever reason she went there with that intent purpose and that she actually broke in in the middle of the night and while the two slept shot them in bed and then scarpered we don't actually know which one it is which well, version it is you would you would surely know from the police reports whether they were lying in the middle of a room being shot or being shot in their beds well we'll find out oh, will we e okay either way two women are dead and ruth needs a plan she does and we need a drink we do. <laughs> Let's pause for a drink. Well, Nick, two women lie dead. <laughs> two women lie dead. It's very Shakespearean yeah, at the moment. It's very dramatic. Mm, very, dramatic very, very dramatic. I have a lot of feelings about this one. <laughs> I've been jaw to the fucking table mm. the whole way through this, and I have thoughts. Yeah, I'm but, glad. We'll see where they go. Oh, okay. So the two women lie dead, and yeah. Ruth has the gun. So Ruth has a gun. What is she going to do with herself? We move forward. October the 18th. Ruth shows up at Phoenix Union Station to take the Golden State passenger train. Her luggage consists of several large trunks. What? They stay with her overnight throughout the train journey until the train pulls into Los Angeles Central Station. Bags are unpacked and left on the platform for her to collect. What? Unfortunately, the, the stench <gasps> surrounding the trunks and the, the grim fluid seeping from the trunks attracts the attention of baggage handlers. <laughs> I'm, 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 I am speechless. She put them in the fucking trunks <laughs> and took them with her. Took them all the way to LA. With her to LA. What did she think was going to happen? Mm. She was going to start a career on the stage with her corpse puppets? So, yes. How yeah. long was this? October 18th? I was only like the, the, the couple of days. Yeah. Uh, and they were... Uh, so yeah, they're starting to get a bit a ripe. Bit ripe, exactly. Now, Arthur Anderson, the baggage agent, he initially believes that they're probably hauling a dead animal because I think <sighs> apparently, apparently um, transporting deer meat 
was was well, uh, enough, smuggling on the train was a thing that happened quite frequently. So he thinks it's probably that it's someone's being hunting. They they're packaging it away. We can we can get around it. These these things happen, but of course it's not damn it. It's not damn it. At all. It's not damn it. Arthur orders that the trunks be held at the station. Um, mm-hmm. And when Ruth comes to collect, he asks her for the key to open up the trunks so she he can see exactly what's going inside. She apologises. She can't open the baggage. Her husband has got the key. If they wait here, she'll run out and get it and come right back. Right back with Absolutely the key. Absolutely 100%. She does I will right be back. right back. <laughs> I'll be right back. Yeah. She's running quite fast. Yeah, absolutely. She must be keen to get that key. Absolutely. Yeah, she does not come back. She <sighs> does not come back. Arthur eventually calls the LA police and reports the suspicious trunk. When you say eventually, was it... I think I... like a couple of hours sort of thing. So <laughs> I'm not like, like a day like and four night weeks later. Sort of. Turning <laughs> over, him standing there going, okay, another day and I'm going <laughs> to totally report this. No, I think it's, like it's a couple of hours um, before it is, it is reported. Now the police, they do arrive and they force the locks. In one case, they find Sammy's head. Jesus Her torso and her legs. Her arms are in another bag. The pieces of Anne have been stuffed into a third. Along with the dismembered bodies, the police also find bloody clothing and some letters. Anything that had been stained with blood in the apartment has been chucked into these bags. She's cut them up and put them in a tr- cut in them a up trunk and, and put them in trunks and then travelled with them. Oh, good lord! Mm. Now, thankfully, due to the the clothing and the letters, the police are actually quite quickly able to identify who these women are, and then notify the police in Arizona that this has happened to two residents. Police begin a citywide search for Ruth, yeah. as one would hope, but she's somewhere in LA, which is generally quite a big place. It's quite large. What the police don't know is that Ruth's brother, Burton, lives in L.A. Okay. He's, a, he's a student in L.A. Um, and he has picked up his sister from the station. Now, he knows nothing, of course, about the murders or anything like that. He's just had a call from his sister go, oh, I'm coming to L.A. Would you mind picking him up from the station? Mm. And he goes, yeah, absolutely. So he drops her off somewhere in downtown and then mm. goes about his business. And she's just left wandering in the city. Well, no one actually knows what her aim is. Is she trying to escape or is she just going to make a new life for herself in L.A.? Or I'm going to be an actress. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who knows? But she does do her best to stay unnoticed, really. She sneaks into a hospital and makes herself at home in one of the rooms for a couple of nights. So an, an, an empty room. She either tucks herself there. Orderlies come and go. Oh, there's a woman there. In the oh, hospital yeah. room. Yeah. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> who cares? Yeah. Exactly. She's there's been a nurse. She can falsify rooms. her little clipboard and everything. Yeah. yeah exactly. So, yeah, a couple of days in there. She then leaves there. She makes her way into a shop, one of the shops on Broadway. Hides out in the shop for three days. What shop was this? So we were assuming some sort of department store or something like that. Was she being a mannequin? <laughs> was she being a mannequin? Was she hiding in a, in a changing room? Was she... <laughs> packed up in a chest of drawers we don't know I'm, I'm not condoning anything that she's doing but also hiding out in a department store for three days is is kind of all of our slight <laughs> fantasies isn't it we all have dreamt of being locked in there and being able to run around in the kitchens <laughs> and sleep in the big beds and like try on all of the makeup I just like the idea that she's posing as a mannequin in the shop floor <laughs> and she comes like no not me and yeah the owners notice absolutely nothing is amiss <laughs> they're absolutely no it's all, it's all good all good now soon the hunt for Ruth is all over the papers back in Phoenix People are paying 10 cents to come and tour the crime scene. They are completely trashing any evidence that was there. Who, who needs that? No, come through, says come the landlord, the neighbours and everyone. Come on through. Please go, no, please don't. Oh, if I get 10 cents. <laughs> come on through. Absolutely. Meanwhile, there's reports in the paper of the mysterious moving mannequin in a department <laughs> store. It's like, we don't even have mannequins. <laughs> this is a cookware shop. Ruth's husband, Dr. Judd, he hears what has what has happened, what she oh, is yeah. accused of. And he actually puts a notice in the paper begging her to turn herself in. Yeah, you've been fuck all help, though. He has not been helpful. He has yeah. not been. But he's actually seeing this thing, this note in the paper that does actually inspire her and does actually prompt her to hand herself in. Okay. And she does present herself to the police station so she's been in hiding now for about six days in various shops in various shops in hospitals things like that and she is actually the police report says she's actually covered in bruises and she's got a gunshot wound in her hand from her from her well, yes, scuffle in the apartment yeah, yeah. so she's actually pretty much pretty bashed up had to keep herself out of sight as she's probably not being a mannequin um, unless she's really gone to town in the makeup department <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> she used the flawless coverage yeah, yeah but yeah. she's pretty seriously injured but she she does present herself to to the police and she is arrested now as she goes on trial the papers dub her the blonde butcher Ooh. or the trunk murderess which is less good 
Trunk murderess is shit. Yeah, blonde no. butcher. Blonde butcher. Yeah, okay, we can get on board with that. Now, she is only tried for one murder, that of Anne, Lo- Anne Loire. The prosecution detail a dramatic story of jealousy and revenge and all this sort of stuff. They also try to point a finger at Jack Halloran, claiming that... Uh, while Good. Ruth, while Ruth is obviously the dreadful murderer, she must have had help dismembering and transporting these bodies, and Good it was point. him. He he must have helped her. The defence, on the other hand, they actually claim self-defence. They do not deny that this Aye. these actions have taken place, but it was self-defence. Mm. She was there seeing some friends. They came after her again, jealousy, revenge. They attacked her. She had to respond, and in fear, she fled. Fled now, with their with their dismembered corpses which is perhaps less explainable really now i mean half of phoenix have been through the apartment now so there's no evidence either way really yeah so as you said earlier like where was the bodies found or anything like that any evidence of that is long gone so we've um, no idea. So we actually like, know. We don't actually know. <laughs> we just know were. that people died. <laughs> people, people died. She claims this is self-defense. Then in other confessions, she claims she confesses to other methods. And there's a few different versions of the events. But no one all can come prove from it. her. Yeah. And then she says one thing, then she denies it later, and then two years later she comes up with another thing. But no one actually knows for sure which is the definitive, oh. the actual version. Ruth's parents are called to the stand and as defence witnesses. And they outcome all the stories of her making stuff up when she was younger. Her, she's desperately troubled. She's very, very unwell. Uh, she's not responsible for her own actions. She's quite mad, they say. So, yeah, not her responsibility whatsoever. The jury don't agree. Ruth Jard is found guilty of first-degree murder on February the 8th, 1933. And Judge Speakman sentences that she should die by hanging. And she is sent to wait execution. Now, while she's waiting for execution, Jack Halloran is brought up on charges. Good. As an accessory to a murder. Ruth even gives evidence against him at his trial. Nice. At his indictment. She says, I'm going to be hanged for something that Jack Halloran is responsible for. I was convicted of murder, but I shot in self-defense. Jack Halloran removed every bit of evidence. He is responsible for me going through all this. He is mm. guilty of anything I am guilty of. Jack's attorney tells the court Ruth's story is nothing more than the story of an insane person. Oh, God. He says. And the judge seems to agree. Oh, what a surprise. Yeah, saying that the state's case was inconsistent and that trying him would be an idle gesture, they say. Now, it is often <laughs> thought about later <laughs> that Jack has used his business connections, his, <laughs> his clout in the city to pretty much brush this under the carpet that he may well have been guilty but he has used his power and connections to make it all go away now jack is exonerated oh he is not he's not charged with anything but his reputation is in tatters really he's all his business partners go you can fuck off he loses his, his wife leaves he loses his house and he dies near penniless about three years later small mercies small mercies indeed now, as the date of Ruth's execution approaches, she pulls another rabbit out of the hat. Okay. Really, 48 hours before she is due to hang, she is able to convince the warden that she deserves a hearing regarding her mental competence. Okay. The warden overturns the death sentence and says, hmm. no, he is convinced that she is insane. Okay. Therefore, you are not going to hang her. You will, <laughs> we will put her in an asylum. Yeah. For the rest of her life, we're not going to execute her. We're not going to kill you. So from prison, she is sent to the Arizona State Asylum for the Insane, as it was then called. <laughs> yes, not now. <laughs> not, not not called now. that anymore. <laughs> um, I believe it's now Arizona State Hospital. And inside the hospital, Ruth becomes quite popular. She she styles other patients' hair. Um, she really gets involved there. She befriends a lot of the guards in order to make her stay a lot easier, mm. really. To, yeah, to get a few perks, things like that. So easy is her stay that she escapes seven times. <laughs> <laughs> seven! Seven times. Seven. <laughs> Not well. Well, she and some of them are for like months at a time. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Before she's, she's rounded up and caught again. Um, what on her the last her final time is the 8th of october right. in 1963 she's now 58 years old fair enough and she walks out the front door god has given her a key <laughs> what god she did to get the key, key. <laughs> I, I don't know but she stole walked, his hair yeah she walks out the front door uh, and makes it all the way to san francisco where she becomes marianne kane she spends six years working as a live-in maid for a wealthy family what until her true identity is revealed <laughs> and she's sent back to the hospital <laughs> 
Yeah. Bloody hell. <laughs> so she's six years there under an assumed name. Oh, and said in 1969, she's returned to Arizona State Hospital. She is eventually re- released a couple of years later in 71. She goes straight back to San Francisco to carry on working for the family who knew her as Marianne Kane. Great. So yeah. obviously they, oh, no, she was obviously brilliant. Yeah, six she was obviously, years. Yeah, and they they have no qualms that she's killed two people. Yeah, yeah, but that you know her version, her of version is different. Events, but also, but, like you know, getting a really good staff. Yeah. Yep, you will absolutely. you will wait for that. She goes yeah. back to jail, going, "Oh, all right, all right they've then. let her go because well, we can't hold this woman. <laughs> exactly. She's 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 the greatest criminal escape artist ever in history. What kind of security level was this hospital? Not good. It's not good. It was just kind um, of the gate was open yeah. of like, okay, do you promise you'll come yeah. back? I mean, the reason that we that people think that she was released a couple of years later was that the governor released her to stop her lawyers talking about the escapes. Yes. Because it will be a huge embarrassment yeah. for the hospital and for the state if this woman is just running in and out of the hospital when she likes. So, okay, okay, she's now almost 70. She's not any threat to anyone anymore. We won't yeah. say any more about it. We won't say any more about it. So that's what seems Worked to well, everyone. <laughs> According to this podcast. <laughs> Ruth Judd dies age 93. Ooh. On the 23rd of October, 1998. 98. Yeah, it is 67 years to the day that she surrendered herself to the LAPD wow. in 1931. Wow. And there's a story of Winnie Ruth Judd. <laughs> 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 what a story, Nick. Oh, that's a good one, and that is a thinker. <laughs> there's a lot of emotions through that story. There's a lot going on there, absolutely. There's a lot, and that's, that's not easy listening, I mm. think, in some places. Not because of the gruesome nature of any of the crimes as often happens on this show but the whole situation is pretty upsetting yeah absolutely as we said during this episode this was just a really toxic series of relationships absolutely absolutely no no question about that and there's a lot of misunderstanding at the time and reporting it and how it's reported later on is kind of like oh what a coincidence that these people all became friends this is a woman who has obviously looked for attention through her childhood for sure and her attention is so linked to children yeah absolutely i mean it seems all she she wants is to be a mother really from such a young age she wants to be and being vulnerable as well and and then ends up in this bohemian lifestyle it does not seem like that set was working out well no absolutely and she see it seems a strange that a woman who is obviously she's still throughout what i've read about the stories she, she's still quite torn up about leaving her husband and obviously takes the, her, those marriage vows mm. quite so quite so seriously the, the guilt isn't it to, but to end up in that sort of very fluid yeah relationship seems like a very big change of character for someone to end up in those sorts of relationships you have to think about that maybe that wasn't entirely her choice oh for sure yeah absolutely it would you know the idea these days about having a fluid relationship and it being consensual and all be like oh free and love and great at that time that idea of that kind of relationship 100 percent jack's oh then that came from yeah absolutely That, that that was jack saying if you want to be with me this is how it is this is how it is and all of you who are involved in this have to dance to the beat of my mm. drum no matter how you feel mentally and all the women are attacking each other and they're yeah. not attacking him yeah i think from potentially from from annie and sammy's point of view it was obviously ruth was i think probably in love with jack um, yes, and yeah, yeah. Infatuated with him, ends up in this relationship, yeah. which is like I never signed up to this, but this will make him happy. Yeah, and I mean Annie and Sammy, they were not. They, no, uh, they, they they were in it for what they could get. I think they were probably in it for, oh, our rent might be a bit less, or yeah, they they're, they're his friends are giving us these gifts and what have you, so if, we're going to benefit yeah um, out of that. So I think, and if you're a lesbian couple, then whatever you can take as a kind of like, look, we're going to make this a lot easier so for I can, you, I can so you don't get arrested. Ruth being really annoyed at that they're going they're just taking him they're just doing that because they want his money but i love him yeah. so did the the two women again is that they were furious about the the other girl being brought into it so do they think is that another person who's going to be blabbing who could share their secrets this True. is a nice close set or what if they were just jealous and they're attacking the other woman they're attacking ruth rather than any of them any of them why didn't they gang up and just yeah. jack this is your problem don't kill him but also like you know what screw you we're all going for lattes Absolutely. together <laughs> we're gonna have bottomless brunch somewhere you do with it you wish and oh was not the option it at was, the time it exactly that just was not the option but the yeah time. what Absolutely. happened in the apartment what happened yeah did ruth lose it she was shot through the the hand now that's absolute fact she yeah. had a, she had a bullet so there was the a hand. battle there. so the thought of her shooting them when they're asleep 
Yeah. Unlikely because there would be there'd be no point blank. retaliation on there and then she wouldn't have been shot and yeah. there, there definitely seems to be a big old fight going on I don't buy the um, shooting in the beds I think no. there was a big fight I am very much on the side that Jack was involved there someone else I, was I involved I think, someone I think else. for the disposal absolutely put them all in a trunk and you take them and it's your responsibility if she has been so browbeating the whole way and just been negged into all of her actions <laughs> she's carrying corpses I mean, also, carrying corpses on a else, train it's a hugely physical activity to cut up two bodies yeah. and carry them down out yeah. of an apartment into a cab or something that. like that to do that alone yeah uh, by yourself but then she did break out of prison seven times i feel like this, <laughs> this woman is, is true she, she she knows her way around if she things put, put her mind to it she can do anything it was exactly seems. So <laughs> perhaps, perhaps she did it all solo oh well wow people I, I think it's time for you guys to weigh in on this one because this this shook me to the core i am not okay with this story but i want to talk about it for the rest of the week i think this is all we'll talk about in suffolk what do you think people tell us your thoughts on this story please weigh in we would love to know your opinions and your feelings on it jump on the comments of wherever you listen to this story and on social media feel free to dm us if you prefer but most importantly when you listen you must mix up a left hand a left hand with the appropriate amount of bitters it turned us didn't it <laughs> it did it turned us absolutely and it turned into a damn good drink mm. so yeah the recipe will be out this evening things you'll no doubt have in your cupboard get on it and see what you think and if you don't have molly bitters chocolate bitters will work if you don't, if you don't have molly bitters just stand the chocolate bitters i appreciate neither of those things are in everyone's cupboard if you have the mole bitters mix one up and if not just have a bolvardier if they or i mean some creole sort of Peychauds might have a bit of that spicy mm. hint that you're looking for potentially. Obviously, it won't have the chocolatiness, but it might have a bit of something. So, if you don't have that, try that. Oh, it's just a Bolvardier. A Bolvardier with a Twix. With a Twix in it. Just stir it with a Twix. Perfect. Why didn't Lovely. we think of that? Or, no, wait. Green and blacks, dark with the Mayan orange. <laughs> no, that like a whole row of that. <laughs> just, just stir that stir up. There. Right, okay. Well, no, I'm doing this weekend. Delicious. <laughs> mix up a cocktail whatever you're drinking this weekend please tag us in your photos share them on social media and tell us why you love them join us on patreon if you haven't already and tell your friends about the marvel that is the poisonous cabinet and please leave us a review on apple itunes thanks for listening guys we have been the people inside the poisonous cabinet we will see you next week and remember your loved ones are trying to kill you oh.